Let's bow together in prayer. Father, this is your holy word. Therefore, you have promised that it would not return void when we cast it out into the world, into our lives. It is supernatural. It makes a a keen difference in the way we view the world around us. It's not just information. It's not just knowledge. It is truth. And therefore, we humble ourselves under it, especially today. This very key foundational reminder about grace, grace alone in Jesus Christ, where we find our confidence. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Missionary Rick Johnson in a, uh, wrote an article in a missions magazine called Brown Gold. And he talks about going to a remote, very remote village in Venezuela a number of years ago. And he entered the village and went into a, a small hut in the very center of the village. And in that primitive setting, he said he found himself in a completely different culture than the one he came from here in the United States. He said, in this hut were two men sitting in their hammocks talking about a cluster of bones hanging up in the rafters of that little hut. And in that cluster of of bones and stuff were things like monkey skulls and toucan bills and animal parts, all from hunts these men had been on. And there as they're talking away, they're, they're remembering their treasured memories Reminders of their worth as warriors and how they are worthy as leaders in their village because of all their treasures hanging up in the rafters. He said, can you imagine a pile of dead bones being kept as precious objects, trophies and treasures of an uncivilized people? And then he says this in the article. He says, but wait a minute. If you're reading this article, do you have an attic? Do you have a garage? Have you rented storage space? What are you doing with the things you are storing? And what do those things you're storing say about you? And we may not collect bones and animal parts to gain our self-worth, but but what about cars and houses and, and gadgets and entertainment components and bank accounts? Do we really treat our treasures any differently than those uncivilized people from those men sitting in the hut? The truth is that what I collect in my garage and what I collect in my life says a great deal about what I truly value. What I collect in my garage and life says a great deal about what I value. In one of his best-known sermons, someone you may have heard of by the name of Jesus Christ, said it this way in Matthew 6, 21, Sermon on the Mount. Where your treasure is, draw a straight line to your desires in your heart because they're on the same footing. That's where your heart is too. Let me give you some background information, and just to let you know, there's a number of times I'll reference some, some of my reference uh, material here. Warren Wearsby is somebody I use quite often today. Jeff Munyon, John Hamby, and Tim Keller, among others. And I'll try to let you know when some of those things occur. So turn, first of all, to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 11 verses in just a moment, verse by verse. We'll go through it uh, one verse at a time. Let me give you this background. Let me just ask you, if you're a parent here or if you've ever been a child, do parents ever repeat themselves to their kids? All the time. And in fact, if you're a kid here today, we're not gonna stop. That's just the way it works. Don't jump on the bed. Don't jump on the bed. Don't run into the street. Don't run into the street. And as they get older, don't text and drive. Be careful. We we repeat ourselves all the time. Why do we do that? It's because it's important stuff. To us, And it's no bother for us to do it, is it? It's not a problem. This section of Paul's letter is, I need to remind you something, believers in the church in Philippi, and it's not a problem for me to do this because it's so important. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Take a look at it. Finally, my brothers, as I come close to the end of my letter, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, it's no trouble for me, and it's safe for you. In other words, what I'm about to say isn't new stuff. You've heard it before. But it's so important that it's not a problem for me to do it. In fact, I'm, I'm anxious to do it for you. But before I declare the truth worth repeating, take a look at verse, T. There's one, verse 2. There's one thing you need to be reminded about. Very simple. I can summarize the entire verse like this. Beware of the dogs. 
Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. In other words, there are some people on their way to your church in Philippi who are about to cause such division among you that they could tear and rip your entire faith community apart. They're like dogs. Now, when you think of a dog, that's not what Paul was thinking of. That's not what the Philippians were thinking of. When you think of a dog, you think of Fluffy, Uh, you know, a little pet you have, and you cuddle up to him, and that's not dogs in the Bible. In the Bible, dogs were not considered pets. They survived in wild packs. They were disease-ridden, feral vermin, like large rats that lived off garbage dumps. They were dangerous to be around especially if you got in the way of their garbage pile. So what is this dangerous dog-like teaching that is coming to the church in Philippi? Let me give you some background, and some of this should sound familiar if you've listened to any of my sermons on Joy Up. Remember that Paul, originally with his missionary team, 10 years earlier went to the town of Philippi. And there you remember that his, at least what we know of as a four-man missions team, a young man named Timothy, who is bringing along as a protege, a a sidekick, a guy who also declared the gospel named Silas, and then a kind of a, a physician historian by the name of Luke were with Paul. These four guys came into the city. You remember how Lydia came to know Jesus Christ first. She was baptized in the river. And then a small group got together and the church was formed. Paul stayed there for a little while. He preached to them. He even underwent having to go through a prison stay there because the the townspeople who didn't appreciate the message of the good news attacked him. But the one thing they declared over and over again was something that we call gospel. Uh, Our translation is best, good news. And the good news is simply this that a generous, holy, all-powerful God and creator stepped into this broken, sin-filled world with a rescue plan. And that rescue plan is sending the second person person of the Trinity, his son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world, live a perfect life, and willingly die on the cross for our sins in our stead, taking our deserved punishment. And the good news further goes on to say that if we, by faith, trust in that gift, that gracious gift, that he comes into our lives and he transforms us. And he turns us not only into people who can relate to him as holy God, no longer enemies of his, but rather children of his. He also connects us with a a fellowship of believers called a church, like the believers in Philippi, like the believers here at Grace Point gathering together. So when Team Paul first came with this message, a few people responded. And then after Paul and his team moved on, some other religious people started coming in and saying, okay, so this new religion that you've accepted, this belief in Jesus Christ, let me compare it to my religion. And as people are are wont to do when religion is discussed, oftentimes there's a lot of comparison going on. So the early believers, they they opened up their resume here about what they believed, and they took out their their packet of what they believed, and it was very thin. It only had one thing in it, Jesus. That's it. I believe in Jesus. Now, if you belong to a Roman or Greek culture, as these Philippians did in that day and time, there were a number of people who were coming and saying, but wait a minute, in our Roman and In Greek culture, we value doing things to earn our religion and our faith and our favor with the gods. And then along came some Jewish people who said, not only that, but we're God's chosen people, and we have a really good resume. We have all kinds of stuff we do, even up to including making sure that our baby boys are circumcised on the eighth day, making sure that we train one another in the truth of of what the Old Testament says, making sure that we follow all the rituals and all the festivals. Look at what we got compared to look at what you got. You got nothing. Now, if all you've got in your resume is something that says Jesus, then these work for your faith kind of people will kind of dismiss you. Your faith is anemic. So the primary debate between Christians in Philippi and the other religions was this question. How much do you have to do to earn God's favor? And so here they are comparing resumes. I've earned more than you do. Have you ever met someone like that even today? 
who kind of is, is, look how much I've done. And in fact, even today, there are still some people considering, maybe even in this room, how much do I have to do to earn God's favor? Some people even feel angry at God for not giving them a better life. After all, God, I've, I've done all these things for you, and this is how you treat me? I deserve better than that. I want to remind you that one of the key messages that Paul is going to declare is that none of us, no matter who we are, can behave our way into salvation. You can't be good enough to be well-behaved enough to win your own salvation. So Paul is saying, so therefore, there's something I want to tell you about, and it's no bother for me. I'm happy to do it. No problem. Every one of us needs just two points today. Isn't this? This is a, this is a red letter day. Two points. Not three, two. The first point is the trash of attempting to behave my way to salvation. Paul begins by making it personal. He says, you want to talk about things like the outward sign of circumcision on baby boys who are Jewish? I'm telling you, we as believers are the true spiritual circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory of Christ Jesus, and we don't put confidence in those kinds of rituals in the flesh. Though I myself, Paul says, has reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has a good resume, has confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I've got more. You want to compare resumes, Paul says? Let me tell you about my Resume. And here's, he begins to unpack it, verses three, four, and five. Here's my resume. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And as to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I became a persecutor of the church for my Jewish faith. And as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. The word blameless in the Greek literally means it can't be improved upon. Most of the believers in the Philippi church were from, as I mentioned, a Greek or Roman background. They were not Jewish people. And if some of the Jewish people came to your church and started to tell you, you know, you haven't done enough. I think you need to become Jewish to be a better Christian. You need to add that to your faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, listen, let me tell you about my pedigree, about my resume, about my qualifications before I became a believer. And he lists them. Circumcision, I had that ritual performed on me when I was eight days old. It was a Jewish custom, which by the way means it wasn't Paul's decision. Whose decision was it? Parents. I was raised in a very observant, dedicated, serious about God family. Today we might say it like this. I was raised in a Christian home. How far does that get you? Then he goes on to say, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. What's the big deal about the tribe of Benjamin? 700 years before Jesus came into the world to be born as a baby, there was a civil war among God's people, the nation of Israel. And they battled against each other. Ten tribes who lived in the north battled against two tribes who lived in the south, and they divided themselves. And the ten tribes kind of were hovered around the north, and they were like the black sheep of God's family. They started to, to worship idols. They kind of drilled off into the wrong direction. But the two that stayed true, they kind of hovered around the temple in Jerusalem. One was the tribe of Judah from which Jesus came. The other was the tribe of, any guesses? Benjamin. In other words, Paul is saying, when our family split, I was on the right side of that. I'm not like those black sheep. I was a good guy. And then he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's more than just saying, I was Jewish. That means I stuck with my Jewish faith. I'm a, uh, uh, on my mother's and my father's side, and my, all of my relatives, I'm German. I speak a few words in German just enough to embarrass myself. And when I do, people laugh at me. Das ist gleichlich. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't speak the language of my great-grandparents. Maybe some of you do, but I don't. I'm not a German of Germans. Do you remember before Paul was converted, he was called Saul, a Hebrew name, and he was Saul of Jerusalem? No, he was of Tarsus. Tarsus and Jerusalem are 400 miles away. His family grew up in Tarsus, Cilicia, 
it's a, a Roman province. But he's stuck with his Hebrew roots. They spoke the language, they did the rules, they did the rituals, they did all the right stuff. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And we are even told in Acts 22, 3, even though he lived far away, that Paul scored a scholarship to a great university in Jerusalem under the, under the leadership of Gamaliel. His parents found a way to send him to Bible school. How many kids, when you send them to Bible school, stick with it? Paul did. He never strayed. In fact, he was a Pharisee, he says. Pharisee isn't just a class you take or a course you take. It's a club you join. It's a little like a Jewish cult, a devotion to rituals and fasting and memorizing Old Testament scriptures and ceremonial washings, learning to argue and debate. In fact, you set yourself apart even from other good Jewish people. In fact, the word Pharisee means separated one. I'm better than all of you. And then he goes on to say, I was even a persecutor of the church. If you know the book of Acts, you know that the very first martyr is a man by the name of Stephen. He declares the gospel and he is dragged out by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and he is stoned to death. And the very last thing it says in, in chapter seven, before you turn the page to chapter eight, is there was a man standing off to the side holding all the coats and his name was Saul of Tarsus, Paul. Now you would think that after these Jewish leaders had stoned to death, what a horrible way to die, by the way. They, they took their coats off so you can get a better better throw at someone, a rock about the size of a potato. There's lots of skull fractures and bone fractures. It's bloody. You don't want your coat to get like that. And there's Paul holding the coats. And you would think that after this horrible act that the Jewish leaders would have said, boy, I guess we took care of that Christian deal because it says as soon as this took place, all the Christians began to scatter. Done with that, right? Not Saul. He stood there, it just fired him up. He even goes to the Jewish leaders and said, I want extra credit, I want to be a lieutenant, I want to hunt down these Christians, I want to drag them back, and he even gets a license to go up to 100 miles away to a place called Damascus. That's where God gets a hold of him, you know the story, if you know the story. Then he goes on to say, and one more thing, by the way, I was blameless when it came to the law. If you've ever read Leviticus and Deuteronomy in your Bible reading through the year, uh, <laughs> you kind of have to work at it, don't you? I do. Maybe you don't. You're more, more spiritual than I am. But it's tough to kind of dig through that. Did you know if you count those all up, there's about 612 to 613 rules in there for God's people. Paul, Saul, had memorized them all. And if he was a Pharisee, the Pharisees were famous for making laws about those 613 rules. They not only memorized those, they memorized these. He was blameless. Paul say, you want to compare? My resume is thicker than your resume. And he says, so you know what I'm going to do with my resume of what I did? Let me show you what I'm going to do with my resume. I'm going to take my resume and I'm going to treat it as if it's garbage. It's not worth anything. In fact, he uses the word there in your King James Bible. If you read it, it says the word dung. Scabalon. Literally, it means to treat something as if it's fertilizer. All my work compared to knowing Jesus Christ is that. A farmer in the state of Nebraska was out plowing his field one day, and there, there are several of these kind of stories, one in India recently, but I like this one the best, because it's Nebraska. And he's plowing in the field, and he sees something shiny in the field up ahead of him. He steps off the tractor, and he comes up to this, this frozen, dark blue crystal about the size of a basketball. It glowed in the sunlight, and it was melting, and it was beautiful. It had an unusual smell, but he wrapped it up quickly in his coat and he, he got back to his truck and he drove back to his house and he, and he put this unusual frozen object right in the freezer next to his T-bone steaks because, by golly, he's going to find out what this is. It's probably a piece of a comet. And he's going to make some money off of this. 
So he chips off a little piece and he sends it into a lab and it comes back with this information. Dear sir, you have sent to us a frozen piece of ice. It is comprised of the contents rejected from a bathroom of a passing airline. Scubalon. Refuse. Resting right there among your frozen hamburgers. Paul said, I've seen the reality of my treasured self-effort to try to win salvation and God's favor. It's worth nothing. Why would Paul take his vast religious resume and toss it in a garbage can? Because he discovered that his goodness was keeping him from God, not drawing him closer. Rather than his self-manufactured goodness helping him gain God's favor, it was pushing him away. Tim Keller in his book, Prodigal God, says this, sometimes we rebel against God by being very, very bad. And sometimes we rebel against God by being very good. Are the good behaviors in my life pulling me towards God's grace and fellowship with him? Or are they preventing me from fellowship with him? We know what Jesus would say because Jesus gave a parable, a story that addresses this exactly. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 10. I'll put it up on the screen for you. And Jesus, he told this parable to some who who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So that's why he tells the story. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a lowly tax collector who cheated Jewish people and gave some money to the Romans and kept a lot of it for themselves. They went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed like this. God, I thank you. I'm not like other men, like extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector stood afar off, wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven when he prayed. He beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus pauses the story and says, I'm going to tell you that this man, this sinner, the second guy, he went back to his house justified before God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So let's review. The good guy, he shows up for work. He's good to his family. He regularly attends church. He tithes. He reads his Bible. He does the right things. He recycles. The second guy, the bad guy, he comes late to work. He cheats on his taxes He spends a lot of time self-medicating. He takes advantage of others. Church for him only happens when there's nothing else to do and there's always something else to do. He cheats on his wife. He doesn't recycle. Jesus would look at these two and say, you know, that, that first guy, that good guy, he's in way more trouble than the bad guy because the, the, the first guy, he thinks he's all right. The bad guy is just a crisis away from realizing I'm at the end of my rope. I, I need help. I need God. I need something. I'm a horrible person. The good guy is going to go through life saying, why would I need to repent to anybody, confess anything? Why do I have to do that? Why? I'm doing all kinds of good things. Jesus is saying only one of these guys went home truly blessed. Remember, read Delgado's last two sermons last Sunday and the Sunday before about the two sons. The wicked son is the one who ended up being made right with his father at the end of the story. It's the good son who ended up bitter and distant and rejecting his dad. Remember, sometimes we rebel against God by being very good, and sometimes we rebel by being very bad. Here's the foundational principle. I must see, I must see the futility of my own efforts to try to get God to love me more. I must trust in God's grace alone who sent Jesus into the world to take my place because there was nothing I could do to earn it on my own. I couldn't even give God a little boost. It's all on him. That's why we call it grace. Number two, the treasure of trusting trusting Christ alone for my salvation. Here comes that verse, verse eight. "For, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish, as trash, 
in order that I may gain Christ. And here's what I want. I want to be found in him. I don't want to have a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. That's worth nothing. But I want to have a rightness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul is making it very clear that getting right with God does not mean bringing proof to God to say, see how much you should love me? What a great guy I am. Why, I am, I'm a find for you. I'm a treasure. Instead, it means depending on God to give me forgiveness through his love and grace. Jesus Christ, I think we would all agree here today, we're in a church after all, I think we would agree that Jesus Christ alone is the only one who ever did it all right, all the time, always. The Bible uses a word for that. It's called righteousness. Let's just use the word right. None of us are ever right all the time. If you are, you should leave now because you don't need anything else we got for you here. Paul states the obvious in Romans 3.10 when he quotes David in Psalm 14 saying, none are right all the time. None are righteous. Not even one. Eugene Peterson, there are no successful churches only various collections of sinners saved by grace, and one of those sinners gets to be the pastor. The cross is where my sin gets transferred to Jesus. My sin gets transferred to him, not because of something I've done, but because of his grace. But the neat part about this, what Paul seems to be saying here and declaring very clearly is not only does my sin get transferred to him, but in that transaction, Jesus Christ's rightness, righteousness, gets put back on me. That, that, is, that should just, we should be gobstopped about that. That is amazing, knowing how sinful I am, that the rightness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness would be given to me. Verse nine, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Someday, I'm gonna die, you're gonna die, it is going to happen. And when I stand before a perfect God, the only thing I want in my folder is three words that say, I'm with him, I'm with Jesus. So Pastor Perry, does doing good, does behaving myself even matter? Why should I bother with that? If it's all up to God, why should I even bother doing the right thing by, you know, going out to the table and picking up a compassion? And why should I do that? It's because Paul was willing to do whatever he could to connect with Christ. Philippians 3, 10, 11. Here's why I behave. I behave so that I may know him and I may know the power of his resurrection. And I may even share in his suffering to become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I can obtain the resurrection of the dead. Paul is willing to do whatever he could, even suffer, as long as he could be in connection with Jesus Christ. Crazy as it sounds, Paul counts suffering in this world as just another way he can hang out with Jesus, his Lord, his Savior, his Majesty. What bonds you to someone in friendship? Think of some of your friends. You're probably friends with people who enjoy doing the same things. Actually, it's probably rare to find someone who loves to go fishing to have a best friend to someone who collects stamps. They just don't match. The only way you'd be willing to be friends with someone like that is if you love that person so much that you're just gonna wanna get to know what they know and do what they do so you can hang out with them more. That's what Apostle Paul says here. Jesus suffered. I don't mind suffering for Jesus because it's just another way I can be with my Lord and Savior and identify with him. What this entire passage is instructing the Philippians about is this. Value God's grace, even if you have to suffer for it. Write this down. This is important. Believers, be, believers behave because we already belong. We already belong through Jesus Christ. Not because we're trying to earn our place of belonging. Why do you want to behave? Because you want to spend more time with Christ. I want to behave in ways that honor the ones I want to be with. God is holy, therefore, I want to live a holy life. God is generous. I want to be generous. God loves others, even those who are hard to love. Therefore, I want to love others, even those who are hard to love. 
But even with this great motivation, we often get it wrong. Jeff Munyon says it this way, we all start out right, humbly admitting, it goes like this, because God loves me through Christ, I'm good. Because God loves me through Christ, I'm good. Because he loves me, I'm good. He loves me, I'm good. And all of a sudden, one day we start saying, because he loves me, I'm good, but because I'm good, he loves me. Why? I'm good. He loves me. Well, by golly, I'm good. He loves me. You see how that happens? We didn't mean it to. The story of grace is not something we move on from. It is something we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over again. But that's no problem, Paul says. I don't mind doing it. I'm happy to do that. Rejoice in the Lord because to write the same thing to you is no trouble and it's safe for you. So let me ask you, what's new here at Grace Point Church? Well, to be perfectly honest, we're still declaring the same message. The message is God, by grace, gives us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Not because we earned it. But wait, Pastor Perry, don't we have a new vision statement? Isn't it on the back of the bulletin? Yes, it's there, but that's really just so we can declare the same message better. That God, by his grace, extends his love to others. Don't we have new buildings here at Grace Point? Yeah, we do. But that's just so we can have greater opportunity to share the same message. Don't we sing new songs? And don't we have new programs? And don't we bring in new people? And don't we preach new sermons? And don't we do new Bible studies and disciple new people? Yes, but it's just so we can declare the same message again and again and again because we tend to forget it. God's grace is our theme. We here at Grace Point want to be a point, a place, a location where that same message gets honored and lived day after day. God doesn't love us because we're good. He loves us because he's good. But Pastor Perry, you've been saying that same thing over and over again for 22 years. That's okay, it's no problem for me. I'm happy to do it. Because grace cannot be earned or deserved. It can only be received. Perhaps you're finding yourself today increasing worn out by trying to be good. Maybe you're increasingly angry, angry at other people who just aren't measuring up to your standard. Then this is the day that you need to be refreshed by the grace and goodness of God through his son, Jesus Christ. Setting the simple goal making it your eternal priority to just spend more time with Christ. Get to know him better, even if it's through suffering. Be patient with God's people. Be loving to one another. Extend yourself to the world through the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way. By the time he writes to his young protege, his young protege is no longer all that young, I'm guessing, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It's the very last book that Paul wrote while he was in prison waiting to be executed. He says to Timothy, you then, my child, be strengthened not by your hard work, not by all the messages you're preaching, not by all the work you're doing and the mission trips you're going on, but be strengthened by the, the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I'm gonna call the worship team forward and I'm gonna give you two things that I came up with this week for how we can be refreshed by the grace and generosity and goodness of God this week. You may have more. You may even have better ones than I do. But here's a couple of things I suggest. Sometime this week, maybe in the early morning or late night, whenever you take a walk or whenever you spend a little quiet time, during a walk or a quiet time, think of one or two specific actions that you've done in your life that you know deep in your heart made you deserving of God rejecting you. You deserve to be rejected, and you know it. Maybe nobody else does, but you do. And then pause from that and thank him for accepting you through Jesus Christ instead. Put that on him. Let's turn that around and do the second thing. Think of some earthly treasure that you admit, you know, I've been spending too much time dwelling on these toucan bills and monkey skulls. Maybe it has dollar signs in front of it. Maybe it has Facebook written in front of it. Maybe it has some possession written in front of it. 
And then ask God to help you put its value behind the greater value of treasuring his grace in your life. Why? Because he alone is worthy. He alone is perfect. He alone is righteous, right all the time. And I just want to lean into him as close as I can. Let's stand together before we sing this closing song. Heavenly Father, thank you that the Apostle Paul was willing to declare this very fundamental message again, that it was no problem for him to do it. We're willing to do that too, Father. Not just declare it, but live it. I always need this reminder. So thank you for the power of your word, its supernatural presence, to correct my thinking when it goes off track. And it will go off track. Even this week it will from time to time, I'm guessing. So Father, give us that power of your spirit, that mind of Christ that drags us back in to the true and pure joy of knowing you, not depending on ourselves and our own trash, but on you and your grace. You are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.